morning, church. You guys can be seated. Good to have you guys here this morning. My name is Pastor Daniel, and uh, I'm happy to have you here. I finally, after being here since 8 o'clock this morning, felt barely warm enough to take my sweatshirt off. A little chilly this morning, huh? Never warmed up hardly in here very much, but I think it has to do with the, these drafty big doors, because we turned the heater on super early this morning. But anyway, bring your jackets to church if you're cold. <laughs> Anyway, good to have you guys here this morning. I got a couple of announcements for you uh, this morning before we get into God's Word. Uh, first and foremost, something I just want to mention to you is as a way of reminder, we haven't really talked about this at all since probably the summertime, but I just want to remind you about COVID sickness and that sort of thing. Like, we have been so taken care of by God at this church. Um, there's been very little sickness in our church. There's been no outbreak in our church. When we had one person get sick back in the summertime, we didn't have service for a week or two just to make sure everything was safe. And so God has just really protected us from that. But I, I just don't want us to get too, 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 what's the word? Carefree on this, okay? And so just a reminder that if you feel any symptoms, um, we would just appreciate that you stay home from church. We just don't want to take any, we just don't want to take any chances. And so if you feel sick at all, have any sort of symptoms, just stay home for the week and then come back the following week. And then the other thing is, if you're comfortable with it, if you get sick and you test positive, um, if you would just reach out and let me know, just so that we can make sure that our ministries, volunteers, congregation are protected from that to the, the best of our, uh, to the best of our um, ability. But I hadn't said anything about that in months and so I just wanted to remind us of that, although I feel like we're really starting to turn a corner there. Um, here's a couple of other things for you, just real quick. Um, first and foremost, if uh, if you're a visitor this morning, if today's your first Sunday here, we just want to welcome you and thank you guys for being here. We ask that uh, you fill out one of these connection cards and just let us know that you're here this morning, name, phone number, that sort of thing. And also anybody in the church who just feels like they need to connect with our body, whether they need to be prayed for, they want to volunteer, be a part of a small group Bible study, anything like that, you can fill out that connection card, drop it in the offering box um, on your way out, and we'll get in touch with you as needed. And with so many things going on in the world today, one of the best ways for you to know what's going on here at Woodlands is to check the boxes that are about halfway down this card that says receive text or email alerts. This way you get a text or an email from us on a weekly basis, just letting you know if there's any major changes, if we're meeting somewhere else, or if we're not meeting a week. A couple weeks ago, we had that really bad snow. We, we didn't meet here. We like last minute to decided to meet down there in the parking lot at the lake because there's just too much ice and snow up here. And that's how we let you know is if you're on those email and text alerts. So you can drop that in the box on your way out. And if you're a guest this morning, it's your first or second time here, you can take that connection card to the uh, connection table on the way back. And uh, and some of the nice ladies there will give you a gift for visiting uh, with us this morning and they would just love to meet you. Um, speaking of the offering box and the connection card and all of that, the only way Woodlands is, it exists is through you guys through your faithful ties and offerings, we're able to continue as a church body in ministry and in outreach, proclaiming God's word and the gospel and making disciples only because you all, even through difficult times, remain faithful to giving. And so we want to encourage you to do that. You can give in the offering box, that tall wooden box is in the back, or you can give online at woodlandscbc.com. And here's the last thing for today. Um, I've been talking to you guys about this since probably summertime, but you guys know that one of the emphasis here at Woodlands is that we feel like God is just calling us to continue to move forward. Go forward, go forward, go forward. Don't stop, don't wait. The time is now. We believe the message of the Bible. We believe the power of the gospel. We believe that hell is serious. Then we cannot stop. And one of the ways that we need you to be involved in this is that as we get ministries back off the ground and we've relaunched our youth ministry and our children's ministry, and we've got it right now, we've got the golf cart ministry that some of you guys come in and out on on Sunday mornings. Um, we've got we've got uh, greeters and all those sorts of things going on. Like we need you all to step up to the plate and volunteer. And it may mean doing something that you've never done before because that's where we're at as a church because we just need new volunteers in all of these ministries. And one of the ministries I wanted to highlight this morning and just allow someone to share about is our children's uh, ministry in our nursery. So I'm going to just ask Julie uh, to come up for a few minutes and just share about what's going on in children's ministry um, right now. So this is Julie, and she's our children's uh, director here at Woodlands Church, if you've never met her. And she's uh, dealing with a knee injury, if you're wondering why she's walking up the stairs slow. You're always slow. There you go. <laughs> Good morning. 
morning, Woodlands Church. How are you this morning? Um, so, like Daniel said, we have many ministries that you can serve in, and we are so blessed that during this time, we have had nothing but increase with uh, the amount of families that have come to our church, and everyone knows that with more families comes more children and needs. So, um, I do appreciate coming up here. We want to launch our children's our nursery again. Um, you've probably seen a few families in here that have their babies on their hip and they have to walk out and walk in and walk out and that's just um, really hard for them to get fed that way. So we really want to get our children's ministry and our nursery um, launched. Um, I did want to share with you what it means to serve and um, where my heart is with serving. And how many of you in elementary school, they you planted a little seed and then you let it grow? You guys remember that? Okay, I do too. So I was just thinking about that while I was thinking about what I would say to you today. And I'm just gonna teach it to you as if I was in the classroom with your kids right now. So don't feel like I'm talking down to you. I'm just pretending like everyone's eight years old right now. So, um, <clears throat> with, um, with the planting of the seeds, pretend like you have your soil in your pot and then you have this little seed and that little seed is a baby or a small child. And the soil is this family where he's protected and nourished, but there's still something that that child needs and it needs living water. It needs to be poured into. And if we start when it's a seedling, then it'll grow into a beautiful flower. But if we don't water that gift, that seed, then it won't turn into this beautiful flower. And um, I just want to encourage everyone that if you have it in your heart to serve, especially in ministry, um, where you can just hold babies and read to them and sing songs about Jesus and tell them about Jesus, wouldn't you want to be the vessel for that living water that pours into those children? And if children aren't your thing, we also have a youth ministry because um, we do newborns through sixth grade. So once they're taller than me, I send them over to Wes and he will be taking care of your kid, kids from there until they're 18. And he, I know he needs a, he has a big need for volunteers as well. Um, especially soon because he will be having a new baby very, very soon. So I know he's in need of volunteers as well, but um, I could really use some women that really just want to sit with the kids and talk about Jesus. And that would be um, from newborns to about kindergarten. So if it's on your heart, please meet me at the table in the back, the connection table. I'll be back there to answer any questions that you may need after service. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. I appreciated the simplicity of what she said. Did you catch that? She just needs some ladies to sit with kids and toddlers and just tell them about Jesus. And I know sometimes it feels like kids are overwhelming and children are overwhelming, but she's absolutely right. Like, that's biblical. Some people sow the seed, some people water the seed, right? Other people reap the harvest. Well, that's where we need you to join us in this. And so, like she said, after the service, um, she'll be back there along with Courtney at the Connection Center. If uh, you have a, it in your heart to minister to any of those age groups, or even if you just want to serve in a ministry like set up or tear down or greeters, there's a big need right, right there right now. Um, if you're not involved somewhere, get involved somewhere today. See them at the table back there. They'll get you signed up, and you'll get a phone call from one of us uh, this week just letting you know when and where you can serve. And by the way, when you sign up for something like this at Woodlands, it's not an every week responsibility. We, we only ask you to serve one week a month, and so it's not an overwhelming responsibility. We all just do our part as a family. So, hey, with that, um, let me pray, and then we'll jump into God's Word this morning. Father, I thank you for the body that is gathered here this morning. Lord, I know many are still, many are still missing because of sickness, Father, or, or uh, worry about sickness, Father, and, and choosing to stay home and worship. And, 
And Lord, I, I do thank you for all of our body that's all over the mountain, Father, those that are worshiping at home, learning at home, reading your word at home. And I also thank you for those who are here this morning. What I pray for in this room this morning is for your spirit to move. Father, I pray that your spirit would work in our hearts. Father, that as your word is read and spoken, Father, that you would convict us and encourage us, challenge us and move in us. Father, I pray that you would inspire people in this room to ministry, to serve, and, and to use their gifts that you've given them. And that, Father, together as a body of Christ, we would minister not only just to this group that's here, but, Father, also to all of Crestline. So, Lord, we just lay those things at your feet. We ask now that you focus us on your word, that you focus us now on Jesus, Father, for these next few minutes as we're in the word. And, Father, that you would just move powerfully and wonderfully in our hearts this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys know what I'm going to say next? You guys got your Bibles? Get your Bibles out and open up to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. One of the most important things here at Woodlands we believe in is we believe in getting God's word into your hands, into your head, and into your heart. I like to say that it doesn't matter what I have to say. It matters what God has to say. And so we've got to make sure that we've got God's word out and open, maybe even with a pen or a highlighter, ready to take some notes. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 17. Why in the world are we in 2 Kings chapter 17? Let me tell you, uh, about a year ago, we started this journey of learning about God's story and about God's people through this story of the Old Testament. Now here at Woodlands Church, if you've been around any amount of time, you know that we spent five years teaching God's word, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the New Testament. And when we got to the end of Revelation, we went back to the beginning. But we didn't teach every word or every verse or every chapter of the Old Testament because there's just so much there. Instead, what we did is we kind of just took the whole narrative of the Old Testament and went big story by big story by big story to learn about God, creation, to learn about his people, the Israelites, and to learn about what it is that he's doing and wants for us. And without a doubt, what we've learned more than anything else is this, is that through the story of God, he desires redemption for his people. And we know the ultimate redemption is coming soon. As we come in near the end here now to the, of the Old Testament, we've got another oh, month or two in the Old Testament. We know as we creep closer and closer and closer that the only true victory comes when we turn the final page of the Old Testament to the first page of the New Testament, which is the story of Jesus. And we're so close to it now, but where are we at in the story now? We're coming towards the end of this story of the Old Testament. We're coming to this place where we've been learning about God's people that we call the Israelites. We've learned about their mountaintop experiences with God. We've learned about them in the valleys. We've learned about them wandering in the desert. We've learned about their great victories along with their great struggles. We've learned about the promises that God has made to them, that God promised to make them a great and numerous nation, and that he promised to give them their own land and their own country. And through all of it, what have we learned about the Israelites? Well, they are always enduringly faithful. Not. We, we've seen the Israelites, no matter what God chooses to do in their story, oftentimes choose faithlessness, choose to walk in lukewarm faith, to walk in evil, to worship false gods, to have false passions. Really, the word is constant wandering and strain. Now, yeah, there's been some great moments of faith. We've walked through some of those stories where God did amazing works and the people were faithful. I think back to Noah and the ark and Abraham and Sarah and Joseph and Moses and Ruth and Deborah and David and Elijah and Elisha. A lot of these men and women who had great faith. But what we've seen in a year's time, generation after generation after generation in the Old Testament, is that the human heart wanders. After false gods, false idols, and in faithlessness. I think the best word that we've used over the last year is lukewarm. Because oftentimes, the, the people of Israel, they, they had a head believer, a head knowledge of God, but their faith had just grown cold and weary. Jesus kind of prophesied about this and warned us about this in the book of Revelation. 
He said, man, I wish, I wish that you were hot or you were cold, but because you were lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. And so we've come to this place now where what Jesus said in the book of Revelation is happening. Like God has come to the place where he looks at his people and he looks at the evil that they're living in and the sin that they're living in and the faithlessness that they're living in. And he says, enough is enough. We're at a time in Israel's history where for 200 years they had dozens upon dozens of kings. And out of all of those kings, only five of them were faithful to God. And if there's something we all know from the lives that we have all lived, we know that there comes a day and time when God says, enough. Which is kind of a difficult conversation, isn't it? Because it feels really good to preach about love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And we like to hear about those things, the good attributes that make us feel good about God. But then all of a sudden we have this dynamic where Jesus says in the New Testament and God in the Old Testament says, I, I, I've just had enough of the sin. I've had enough of the evil. And we have this dynamic where God is God. And he is God on the throne. And he is creator. And he is totally holy and totally righteous. And we have a God that hates sin while at the same time we have this other element of God's character. That he's a father. And not just a father, but a good father. A good father that is faithful. That is full of mercy and love and grace and forgiveness. In fact, I would say that all of those things in his character are, are immeasurable. And we have God as leader. He is valiant. He is courageous. He is strong. And so how do we bring those two things together? God that is holy. God that is righteous. God that demands an atonement for sin while also God that loves and is full of mercy and grace and forgiveness. But what we have is when we bring those two things together, we have perfection. We have the perfect Father. He is a perfect God and perfect Father that when the time is right, do you know what He does? He disciplines and He corrects. Because a good Father does those things. A good Father doesn't allow injustice to continue. A good Father doesn't allow disobedience and sin and evil to continue. And guess what? That's exactly where we find the Israelites. For 200 years, God looks down, sending his prophets with a message of come back to me, repent, return to the Father, return to the Creator, return to God. And what do they do for 200 years? Nothing. They're lukewarm. And God says, enough. And so look at it with me. You should be in 2 Kings chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 6. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. And he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in law and on the harbor, the river of Gozan, and in the city of Medes. Now, I fully realize that when we read 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6, it seems oddly insignificant. So a king attacks Israel, captures Israel, and then Samaria, and then they take the people. I can't tell you how significant this moment is. This one single verse feels insignificant, but the significance cannot be overstated. Because God is finally... Finally allowing his people, his country, and his land to be attacked, destroyed, and to send the people to disperse. This is huge. Because for more than 200 years, regardless of what the people of Israel did, God watched over, God protected, God provided. But now he says to the people, I have sent my prophets. You have heard the word. You have heard the call to come home. Yet you still do not listen. 
And so what does God say? He says, enough. He says, fine. He says, go. Well, what would bring God to do this? How far had the how far had the Israelites gone? How much evil? How much sin? How prolific was it? Well, we get a little taste of it further on in this chapter. Read with me verses 7 through 14. It says, and this occurred. So the Bible is actually going to tell us why God allowed the Israelites to lose their land and to lose their country. It says, and this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the custom of nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places. Those are altars of worship to false gods. They built to themselves high places in all their towns. From watchtower to fortified city, they set up for themselves pillars and ashram on, the, on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord's anger. And they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with the law that I commanded your fathers and that I sent you by my servants, the prophets. This is quite an indictment against God's people. God looks down on what is happening. He says, Your hearts have turned from me. He says, Don't you remember the stories of your fathers? Don't you remember how I led them across dry land over the sea? Don't you remember how I met them on the mountaintop in fire and smoke and earthquake? Don't you remember I delivered them in slavery? Don't you remember the manna that was come down from heaven, the water out of the rock? Don't you remember all of the victories? Yet what have you done? God says to the people, your heart, your affection is turned. It's turned from me. And now you're worshiping other gods. You're making idols of other gods. You're sacrificing to other gods. You're doing things in secret to sin against me. You've got false passion, false gods. And God looks down and he says, I have just had enough. That's why. Hasn't there been a time in all of our lives when we've come to this place? Hasn't there been a time in our lives where God has allowed us to reach that proverbial rock bottom? That's exactly what's going on with the Israelites. God says, I have done so much. I have given so much. There's nothing else to give except to let you Go. Understand that God is not forcing Israel to go. He's not even telling Israel to go. He's letting them go. This is an ageless story. This is a relevant story. This is a story that has happened from the very beginning of the Bible, starting with Adam and Eve, and has continued throughout all of humanity until now. With us even. We continue the story today. Do you know what the story is? It's the story that Jesus told in the New Testament. It's the story of the prodigal. You guys know that story? This is the story happening in Israel. Of the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter. Oh, you have to have heard this story. And if not, you're missing a good one. Do you know the story says that this father, he had two sons. And one day, one of the sons went to his father and said, Father, I want half of my, I want, I want my half of the inheritance, and I want it now, because I want to leave. And you know what the father does? The father says, here, son, take it. It's yours. 
The Bible says that then the son took it and he gathered all his things. And what did he do? He went on and lived recklessly. He lived in sin, spending his money frivolously, living in evil. Until a time came when he had no money. And when he had no money, guess what happened? He had no friends. And when he had no friends, he had no roof over his head. And when he had no roof over his head, he had no food in his stomach. Do you know what happened to the prodigal? He lost everything. He hit rock bottom. It's the very same story that we're learning about the story of the Israelites. It's the story of all of God's people. Do you know something? This is your story. And this is my story. Why? Because at some point during our lives, our gaze comes off of Jesus and off of the cross. And we gaze on something over there or something over there. And all of a sudden we think there's something better. The grass is greener. It's more fun over there. There's no more money and more prosperity over there. There's more of the things that I want over there. And what does God do? God allows it because he gave us a free will. And so we wander and we stray. And where does that lead us? It leads us nowhere good. Have you ever wandered or strayed from God and then got there and said, man, I'm glad I'm here? Oh, it's the complete opposite. When we wander and stray from God, we get there and fall on our faces and say, God, please. God, please. Please take me home. Sin and evil promise big things, but they are both liars and deceivers. And wandering and straying and sin takes us to a world that is turned upside down, which is exactly where Israel is. In effect, God says, you think there's better out there? Then go get it. And where does Israel end up? They end up beaten up, broken, and destroyed. They end up with nothing. Nothing. You guys relate to rock bottom? You relate to coming to a place where there was no hope? There was nothing else but desperation? Here's the good news about our good Father. Though God lets us wander and stray, do you know what He is always ready for? He is always ready for us to come home. Always. Always and forever. In an instant, God's arms are open. The Bible says in that very same place that I was talking about what Jesus said uh, in Revelation chapter 3, it says that he stands at the door and knocks. No matter how much we fail or fall or sin or live in evil, the beauty of the gospel is, is that at any moment, God's arms are open and outstretched for his people to come home. And do you know that's exactly what happens with the Israelites? Turn over a page to chapter 18. Turn over a page to chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. 2 Kings 18, 1 through 8. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel... Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And catch this, verse 3. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. 
Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria. Those are the ones that had attacked Israel and destroyed their land. And he would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Check this out. After 200 years, this man, Hezekiah, steps up to the plates. He looks around at Israel and says, enough is enough. And he kicks down the idols. And he cuts down the Asherah trees, which were places of worship. And he pushes down the altars. And he says, we will honor God. And he trusted him. And he followed him. And he kept God's commandments. And he rebelled against the evil that was in the nation, the Assyrians. And he led them in this rebellion to win back their faith. God had said enough. You guys can go and do what you want to do. But now this man, Hezekiah, steps up and says, no more. It is time for the people of the Lord to return this is the beauty of the story of God and his people. This is the beauty of the story of the prodigal son that out of ashes, that literally out of the ashes, out of the wreckage, a man named Hezekiah leads the entire prodigal nation of Israel back home. This is a beautiful picture of what we can choose to do. It's that story again. It's the story I told you a moment ago. It's the story of the prodigal. This is the story of the prodigal happening right in front of us. Because what happens with the prodigal? The prodigal, prodigal goes and lives in wild living. He blows his money and all of his father's money. He ends up with nothing. No home, no food, no friends, no family. What does he do? The Bible says that there's a famine in the land. There is nothing for anyone. And he has no other choice but to sell himself into slavery. And he does. He sells his life to a farmer. And the farmer sends him to go take care of the pigs. And one day, hunger had gripped him so greatly. He looked down at what the pigs were eating. And he picked it up. And the Bible says that he came to his senses. Depending on the version of the Bible you said it, 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 you have, it actually says he came to himself. It's as if he had this reawakening of what am I doing? Who am I? Where am I? And what does the prodigal decide to do? He decides to do the very same thing that Hezekiah did. He decides to go home. What's interesting about going home is it's not always easy. When we find ourselves at rock bottom, that's one of the hardest places to live because we have nothing. We have to start over from square one. And a lot of it starts with some pretty hard conversations. Can you imagine being the son who wasted half of his father's fortune and having to go home and face his father? Can you imagine living in sin and falling to a place where sin and evil has so gripped your life that you have no choice but to look on Jesus and beg the God, the creator of heaven and earth for help and salvation? Like going home isn't easy. But Israel had no choice because they hit rock bottom. The prodigal had no choice because he had hit rock bottom. And going home from Israel was a very difficult task. Hezekiah wanted to lead them back in battle. He wanted to go defeat the Assyrians. He wanted to take back the land. He wanted to win this great war for the Lord and his people. But the Assyrians were not people to be messed with. They were great in battle and they numbered in the hundreds of thousands. And by this time, Israel had been so beaten and broken and the people had been so dispersed that there was only a tiny remnant of people left of the tribe of Judah, the Bible tells us. 
So Hezekiah finds himself in this difficult place where he wants to lead this rebellion. He wants to lead the people back to faith. Yet the odds are stacked tremendously against. And so what does Hezekiah do? He does the one thing that we often don't think to do. Why is it that when we're stuck at rock bottom, one of the last things we think to do is to call on God? We just want to dig ourselves out. We want to build a new foundation. We want to figure it out on our own. But what does Hezekiah do? The odds are stacked against him. And so he does the only thing that he can do. Because here's the word again. He's desperate. I'll tell you something. When God's people are desperate, that is, a, that is the most wonderful place to be. Because we have no choice. We have no choice but to turn to God. And to wait for him to show up. Look at how Hezekiah prays. Turn another page over to 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. Look at Hezekiah's prayer with me. It is a powerful prayer. 2 Kings 19 verses 14 through 19. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Basically, Hezekiah had received a letter from this king and this army saying, You're dead. In layman's terms, okay? Verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent to mock, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria have laid waste to the nations in their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they are destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, Save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. I'll tell you what, you should circle this and bookmark this. Man, if we prayed like this, if we prayed like this, if we were desperate like Hezekiah, Hezekiah looks out at his remnant of Israelites that weren't even warriors. And then he looks out at hundreds of, a th hundreds of thousands of Assyrians ready to do battle. He has no choice but to say, God, God, we are your people and we need you. We want to come home, God. We want to come home. But the only way that we can come home is if you show yourself or we will be destroyed. We are nothing without you, God. I pray and hope that our hearts would be so cut that we would pray like this. That we would get to such a place where we weep and mourn over our own sin and over the sin of our nation and over the, the, the terrible things that happen all around us that we would just pour our hearts out to God like this. Father, we are nothing without you. Will you please move? Hezekiah was a faithful man. He was a heartfelt man. And what he prayed was true. And after 200 some years of disobedience and of God allowing the Israelites just to go on their own way, after 200 years, God shows up. You can read the whole thing. It starts in verse 20 and it goes all the way to the end of the chapter. But I just want to highlight verses 27 and 28 of what God says to the people. Look at verses 27 and 28 of the same chapter, chapter 19. This is God responding to the nation. He says, and actually God here is speaking to the Assyrians. He says, but I know you're sitting down and I know you're going out and coming in. And I know you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me and your complacency has come into my ears. I will put 
my hook in your nose, and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way in which you came. God looks down, and he says, I am going to move this mountain. We need to just pause and breathe this in for a moment. God on the throne, God the good Father, has watched his people live in faithlessness. He has allowed a tidal wave of judgment upon them, which was fair and just, by the way. He has allowed the nation to be destroyed, to be abused, to be dispersed. Their land has been stolen and pillaged. There is only a remnant of Israelites left. Hundreds of thousands of military men stand ready to destroy what is left of Israel. And God hears the prayer of a righteous man. And he says, this is what I'm going to do today. He says, I am going to bridle the mouth of the enemy. This is what you put over a horse or an ox. It goes in their mouth, straps of leather. And he says, today, today I am going to turn them away. We like to say things like, my God can move mountains. But sometimes I question by the way we act and live if we really believe that. Do we really believe that in a moment's notice, God can move mountains? Or that God can turn away 200,000 military men? A sea of men is ready to overwhelm Israel. And God says, not today. Not my people. We may lack faith that he can move mountains. But you know what God says? He says, I will move mountains this mountain. And here's the thing. God is a man of his word. Don't ever miss that. God is a man of his word. And if he says he's going to turn the enemy away, do you know what he's going to do? He's going to turn the enemy away. This is the last part of the passage. Verses 32 through 36. Therefore, as thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mounted against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. God says, not today, not my people. This is my land and this is my people. Verse 34, for I will defend the city and save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Verse 35, and that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. Don't miss what happens in a couple of short verses. In just a couple of short verses, Israel is on the cusp of being annihilated. And God says, not today. And the Israelites didn't even have to pick up sword or shield or chariot or a horse. God's spirit goes across the camp and lays waste to 185 thousand men that were enemies of Israel like that. You know what's amazing about this verse? Is it again feels insignificant. It's one verse, verse 35 says, and that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000. And it's here now and it's gone now. It doesn't even feel dramatic but church family, church family, catch this. In one sentence, God speaks, his spirit moves, and the people are delivered. That is the God that we serve. And that is the God that we worship. When we show up here at 1030 and then after the message and we sing some songs, 
It's not because songs are fun to sing. It's because we are worshiping the God that can speak, send a spirit, and move in an instant. This story may not feel all that dramatic, but you know what story does end pretty dramatically? The story of the prodigal son. We left the prodigal son eating the pig slop and then coming to his senses. And he says in his head, he says, what am I doing here? He says, even the servants of my father eat better than me. He says, I'm going to go back and I'm going to repent and I'm going to ask for forgiveness of my father. And I don't even want to be his son anymore. He says, all I want to be is one of his servants. And he turns and he goes back. But do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the father was watching. And it says from a long way off, his father saw him. And his father got up. And he ran to his son. His son at this point didn't even have a chance to say a word. He just got up and ran. And he throws his arms around his son. And he kisses him. And the Bible says that he puts a robe around him and shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. And it says that the father said, My son, who was once lost, is found. Who was once dead, is now Alive, and then they throw a party. That is a dramatic story of unreal supernatural grace, which is found in no other place, church, than in Jesus Christ. I just want you to see this before I go. The Father immediately, immediately and without hesitation, takes his son back. Will you please not miss that? We've been taught in society that we have to earn what we get. That if we want to make something of ourselves, we have to work harder or learn more or work more hours. And so that relationship we have with society tells us that the only way we can be made right with God is as if somehow we dig our way out of this. That is not how God works. Do you see how God works? Immediately and without hesitation. The Father, God, opens his arm and embraces what was lost. I have to ask here today, if there's anyone who's in that boat. Is there anyone in here this morning who, who feels the Holy Spirit tugging on their hearts? Is there anyone in here this morning that feels like the Israelites or the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter where they, they have just come to rock bottom? Is there anyone in here this morning that says, I, I just need mountains moved and I don't know how it's going to happen? I need forgiveness. I need salvation. I need a new heart. Is there anyone in here this morning that feels that calling to come home? Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. But here's what you have to hear from me this morning. There is only one way to salvation. There is only one way to be made right with God. There is only one way to come home. And the Bible says that his name is Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible says that God sent Jesus. That God sent his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And so what I ask today is, is this you? Today, do you need to come home? 
Today, do you need God to move mountains? And what I say to you is if that's you today, then run, run to Jesus today. If you feel that spirit stirring in your heart, if you feel that tug, if you feel that pull, if you feel God moving and you just know that today you need to renew your relationship with Jesus, you need to come home like the prodigal, or maybe you need to give your life to Jesus for the very first time, I say do it and do it today. Today, come from the dark to the light. Come from the valley to the mountain. Be pulled out of depression to joy. Move out of pain to freedom. You can have it today, but it comes through no one else and nothing else than Jesus Christ. And so I tell you today, if that's you, give your heart and your life to him. I'm going to ask as I close my message that we just all bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. If you're a believer in the room, just be praying. If you're in this room this morning and you're a believer, but, but you've fallen, you've gone prodigal, you're living in sin or you're in evil, living in evil, this message is for you. If you're in here this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, this message is for you. And let me remind you one more time of what Jesus says. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. And he will open that door to you and embrace you as his son or daughter immediately and without hesitation. And so I say, if that's you today, I just want to ask you to pray with me. I like to say that, that when you pray, when you ask God to move in your life, when you ask God for salvation, when you invite Jesus into your life, it's not the perfect words that matter, it's the right heart that matters. What we need to say is, God, I need your forgiveness. I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins and was risen back to life three days. And God, I am a sinner in need of the salvation that only Jesus brings. And we ask him to forgive us and to heal us and to bring us home today. And so if that's you today and Jesus is knocking I want to ask you to open up your heart by praying this along with me. Father, I know my sins have separated me from you. But today I want you to come. But today I want to come home. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died and rose again. And today I ask for forgiveness. Today I ask for salvation. Father, heal my heart and bring me home today. I want to ask you to just keep your heads bowed for a moment. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or raise your hand, but I want to just be able to pray for you in this moment. So if you gave your heart to the Lord today or you renewed your commitment to the heart, you renewed your commitment today to the Lord, you just look up at me so I can pray for you? I won't call you out by name. I won't challenge you here. Thank you. Thank you for your faith. Let me pray over these people. Father, I thank you for those this morning who have chosen to renew their faith. Father, you know who they are. Father, you know the ones that came home. Father, what I pray now is that you would move mountains in their life. Father, I pray that you would take them from rock bottom or wherever they find themselves, Father, and that you would lift them up. Father, I pray that you would take their discouragements and their despair and turn it into joy. Father, I take, pray you would take them from the valley to the mountain. I pray that if they're dealing with pain and sorrow, Father, that you would set them free. Father, we thank you for people willing to follow you. So we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're going to close my time with you this morning in communion. Dave's going to come around and uh, if you didn't get one on the way in, you can grab one now. Dave, let me grab one real quick, please. Thank you. If you didn't get one, just put your hand up and we're going to take communion together.
Normally we take it apart, but today we're going to take it together. If you don't know what communion is, communion is a time when believers come together and the Bible actually says, do this whenever you meet together. And so what do we do every Sunday? We take communion together. But what communion is, is it's a, it's a reminder and it's a celebration of Jesus. If you believe in the Jesus that I just preached, if you believe in the Jesus who died on the cross and was risen back to life, then today we celebrate and remember him today by taking communion. This is all a reminder in memory, in worship, and in celebration. We take the bread remembering that Jesus' body was broken on the cross. We take the juice remembering that his blood was spilled, all of it for forgiveness and grace and for a new covenant that we get to live in life and no longer in condemnation. And so today we're going to celebrate Jesus together. And so if you've managed to get these silly little things open, let's take the bread. And on that night, what Jesus did with his disciples before he went to the cross is he took a loaf of bread and they passed it around and they each took a piece and then they ate it. And Jesus says, do this, remembering that my body was broken for the forgiveness of sin. Let's take it and remember Jesus together. And then it says later in the evening after the meal, Jesus took a cup of juice or of wine and he passed it around and he said, all of you drink this, remembering that my blood was poured out, poured out for a new covenant, a new covenant no longer of judgment, a new covenant no longer of death or eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, but the new covenant because of Jesus' blood is that we live in grace. Take this with me. Let me pray one more time. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Father, without him, we don't have anything. Without him, we are nothing. Father, without him, we are aimless, we are directionless, and we are rudderless. But Father, with him, we have everything. We have, the Bible says, we have every spiritual blessing. The Bible says that with Jesus, you will provide for all of our needs. And so, Father, today, even though we learned about him from the Old Testament, today we celebrate Jesus in the Old Testament. We celebrate that we have a new life in him, that we have been born again by his body and by his blood. And that by him, Father, we don't have to live as the world tells us. We don't have to live chained and restricted. But Father, we can live in the freedom that you give. Freedom from darkness, evil, and sin. Father, you are truly a good God and a good Father. And what I now pray over this congregation is, Father, that we would be so moved by how good Jesus is, that we would be so moved by how great you are, Father, that we couldn't help but lift our voices in praise to you. So, Father, pour out your spirit in our hearts and in our lives. Encourage us and give us joy. Father, may these closing moments together just... Father, may they just be joyful in your ears, Father. May the aroma of our worship be sweet on your nostrils, God. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.
It's coming alongside after God has saved you and offering to him thanksgiving and worship through service. So stop at the Connection State table on your way out if you want to sign up for a ministry. Other than that, church, you're dismissed. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll be back here next Sunday to worship.